Get ready. Come on, y'all. Get ready to make some noise as the black and gold rises up and we stand behind them boys. It's a countdown to a celebration for the whole who that nation. So let's play it true. See them through on WDSU. You're taking a live look from inside the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in just two and a half hours. The Saints will look to continue their winning ways and pick up their first home win since November 1st. And this is a live picture from high atop the Hyatt Regency. Saints fans starting to trickle in to Champion Square in the Dome despite some really bad weather today. Tonight's matchup right here on WDSU pits the 4-9 Detroit Lions versus the 5-8 New Orleans Saints. And welcome to our WDSU Saints Countdown to Kickoff coverage. I'm Fletcher Mackle, joined alongside sports anchor Sharif Ishak and former Saints head coach Jim Moore. Coach, are you excited about tonight's game? Four and nine, five and eight. I'm excited. I'm always excited about an NFL game, but I think tonight's going to be a great game for fans there at the stadium to watch and people on TV to watch because you've got two really good quarterbacks, two of the best in the league, and you've got two uh, not so good defenses. I think there's going to be a lot of scoring activity, a lot of exciting offensive players on both sides of the ball. It's going to be an exciting game to watch. And we have team coverage tonight across New Orleans. Randy Russo is live inside the Superdome. Right now, Fair Arena sat down with Pro Football Talks' Mike Florio to talk what's next for the Saints draft class. Anchor Camille Whitworth went behind enemy lines with Bernie Smilovitz from WDIV-TV in Detroit, and Adriana Hopkins and Margaret Orr are back in the studio with the latest news in weather. Now, while the Saints won't be heading to the postseason, there are still a few bright spots this season for the black and gold. Yeah, Fletcher, the 2015 draft class brings back memories of that famed 2006 draft class in 06. The Saints picked up players like Jari Evans, Roman Harper, and Zach Shreve, among others. And just a few months ago, they tried to top the 06 draft class. It gives the Saints hope that rookies like Haoli Kakaha, Stefan Anthony, and Willie Sneed will lead them for years to come. We are joined right now with the Great Dane. Congratulations on being inducted into the Ring of Honor. We were just looking at your the area where your name is going to go. Talk about some of your fondest memories with the Saints, being part of the team for so many seasons. Well, you played for, for as long as I did, 25 years, and 13 of them were, were here. And I think what I remember the most and what I'm most mindful of tonight is, is the, all the help I got and all the great teammates I had and coaches that put me in positions to succeed and allowed me and trusted me to go out there and do what I did. And so really, I'm very mindful of that. And then I'm very mindful and humbled by the relationship I had with the fans here. It was really a love affair on many levels and, and uh, just spending time off, off the field and doing work in the community and getting out and meeting everybody and make, trying to affect change and make a difference. That's really what I'm going to take away. Are the glory years over for the New Orleans Saints? Is the great run over for the black and gold? In 2013, the Saints went to Seattle on a Monday night, and things have really never been the same since then. The black and gold lost to the Seahawks 34-7 in that showdown, and since that game, the Saints are 14-20 in the regular season. Now fans are left to wonder if the best days are behind them. Tonight we say goodbye to the greatest run in franchise history. The Saints from 2006 through 2013. RIP. Thanks for the memories. From Gleason's block to Deuce's run, Hartley's kick, ambush, and Lombardi Gras. It was amazing. Those teams lifted our spirits after Hurricane Katrina, truly making an entire community feel strong when it was at its weakest point. We'll all be forever grateful for the greatest run in Saints franchise history. That's why it's hard to say the great run is over. No more sugarcoating it. No more kidding ourselves. Truth be told, we've been spoiled since Sean Payton and Drew Brees arrived in 2006. The two found immediate success and became the darlings of the new pass-oriented NFL. The only real growing pains came in 07 and 08, but even during those campaigns, we all knew something special was brewing and the Saints were close. The only thing they're close to now is the number one overall pick in the 2016 NFL Draft. So how did we get here? 
Since hindsight is always 2020, it's clear now. Bad drafts, bad big money contracts for veteran players are resulting in a dire salary cap situation. An aging quarterback who's probably not 100% healthy and no longer capable of carrying the team on his back. It also doesn't help that the head coach's name has been linked to other NFL jobs. Players see all of this and they read all of this. They're smart. While the locker room is filled with high quality guys who'll fight until the end and act like professionals, there is no doubt that doubt about this season as well as the future of Sean Payton and Drew Brees and the greatest run in team history is now on the minds of the players. And that's hard to overcome. So no more romanticizing about Payton and Brees becoming the next Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. Dynasties like New England are once in a generation. To me, the Patriots are like the Rolling Stones, ageless, amazing, and always on point. The Saints are like Elvis Presley. In the glory days, both Elvis and the Saints were awesome and electric. But like Elvis in the later years, the Saints have become sort of sad and sloppy. Even at his lowest point, people still went to see the King perform and will still go see the Saints play. But Presley fans then knew that they were watching a shell of the formerly great original. And we know that now regarding our city's NFL football team. That was a commentary that I did earlier this season and just updated for tonight because you now know how I feel. I think that the Saints are a shell of the formerly great original. Do you think the glory years are over? Can, okay. can Drew Brees lead them to another playoff run before he's done? Are they, are they, is it done? You know, the glory years, who was our head coach? Sean Payton. Who was our quarterback? Drew Brees. Are they still performing like they should be performing? Yes, Sean is. I'm convinced of that. And Drew Brees, look at the stats and look at the offensive stats of the New Orleans Saints. Are they the same offensive team that they were during the glory years or when they won a Super Bowl? It's hard to win successive Super Bowls. They won one. Give them credit for that. And that was great. 11-5 and five two years ago. All right? That's hard to come by. Offensively, are they as good offensively now as they were a few years ago when they were winning 10, 11 games? Are they? Maybe. Why not? I don't think the protection is still there for Drew Brees. Maybe the receiving core isn't as strong. Not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, but, but it's, okay, it's cl close. I mean, close. you look at statistics, and they're still one of the top offensive teams out of 32 teams in the NFL. You look at the stats. They are. Points scored, yards, all that kind of stuff. Where have they faltered? They faltered on defense. There are no good on defense the last two years. Seven and nine and whatever they're going to be this year, the best eight and eight. They're terrible on defense. They're bad. Okay, that's where they faltered. Can they get better? If they can get better soon, then the glory years aren't over. What are the glory years? They expect them to win a Super Bowl every year? They're not going to. How many teams do? It's hard to do. I mean, if you expect them to win a Super Bowl every year, even be in a Super Bowl every year, then you're asking for too much because it's difficult in the NFL. It's a very competitive league. A lot of good teams. Everybody's fighting and trying and spending money just like everybody else. Some people get it done. Some people don't. You know my favorite part of these shows? Why? When you start pounding <laughs> well, the desk. I'm just telling you. I don't know. You know, I... They're over right now, the glory days. Yeah, they're over right now because they're seven and nine last year and maybe eight and eight this year. But can they be better next year? Can they become 11 and five last next year? Maybe, you know, if they get better, if they get better on defense. That's where they got to get better. A lot of fans starting to fill their seats here inside the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. And one local chef has a unique connection to both the Motor City and the Crescent City. The mastermind behind some of New Orleans' sweetest confections actually has a love for both the Detroit Lions and the Saints. So we take a look at the inspiration behind his dual love and how that inspiration translates in some of his sweet creations. When he moved to the U.S. from England nearly 30 years ago, Tarek Hanna aspired to become an architect. So it's a chocolate mousse that sits on top of a pecan tart. And he certainly did, becoming an engineer of sweet treats, designing works of art out of chocolate, pastry puffs, and mousse as the executive chef of Sucre in New Orleans. So the looks on people's faces when they walk in and they see all this beautiful product, 
that's probably the most gratifying thing. Yeah, and they realize how good it really is. Well, that's that's really the payoff. People across the globe have embraced his confections, just like he's embraced his adoptive city, the inspiration behind his famous macaroons, eclairs, and pastries. But as Hana rolls up his sleeve to create those masterpieces, one may notice his tale of two cities. I bear the brands of both cities. The old English D for the Detroit Lions and the fleur de -lis representing the Saints. My heart bleeds both Honolulu blue and silver and black and gold. Prior to moving to New Orleans, Hannah spent the better part of two decades in Michigan, the place where he fell in love with American football and the Lions. His adoration for the game even translates into his business operations, running his pastry counter a lot like managing a football team. That should have been a new set of downs. And some of those stars have made him some big plays. Oh, you totally scored with this one. High five on that. Yeah. Opening drive. All the way. But when it boils down to game day and the weeks in which his two favorite teams go head to head, he admits he's left conflicted rooting for both. And when they play each other, and if I'm at the game, I have to make an announcement to the entire section that I'm sitting in because I will scream and I will cheer and I will boo every single play. However, he is thrilled to see some recent connections between the two teams with some of his favorite players from the black and gold, like Lance Moore, sporting the blue jersey. Lance Moore, he went to Pittsburgh for a year and then beginning of the season, my dreams came true. He went to Detroit. But his biggest dream right now would be to see the Saints or the Lions making it to the playoffs. I, I suppose, um, the Lions could make it to the playoffs if every team in the NFL just laid down and forfeited every game for the rest of the year. Um, stranger things have happened. But as we all know, that dream, unfortunately, isn't going to be a reality this year. Both the Saints and Lions eliminated from postseason play, but there's always next year, right? Now, there's a lot of questions surrounding the Lions being here in late December. So for more on that, let's go to anchor Camille Whitworth and WDIV sports anchor Bernie Smilovitz. All right, Bernie, thanks for being with us. Let's get straight to it, shall we? The Lions have played woefully mediocre this season. They're just four and nine, as we all know. So how can they come into New Orleans and be successful tonight? Well, that's the question of the year, and I'm not sure they can. They've, uh, they, I think you've been kind when you say they've been woefully mediocre. They've been simply awful, except for a short, short stretch in the second half of the season. They started off one and seven, and they've kind of lost their mojo in the last couple games. And I think they lost their heart and their spirit against the Packers here on the Thursday night game when Aaron Rodgers. Uh, that is a game where the Lions led the entire 60 minutes yet lost because another play was put back on the clock with no time left on the clock and the Hail Mary by Aaron Rodgers to Rodgers uh, beat them and I think that took the heart and spirit out of the team they showed very little against St. Louis last week and not many people feel they can win in New Orleans tonight. I went with former Saints defensive back Tyrone Hughes to Tulane Julman Stadium and he showed me what the Saints need to do to stop the Lions best target. All right, welcome into Yuleman Stadium. I'm here with Saints Hall of Famer Tyrone Hughes. All right, Tyrone, let's talk about Calvin Johnson, Lions big time receiver. Megatron. Megatron, 6'5", 230, 235. Talk about how you contain him. I know it's kind of hard to contain a guy it's, that big. It's, it's really hard to contain Calvin Johnson, um, and it also depends on what type of cornerback you are. You know, are you an aggressive press type corner, or do you just have the speed as a smaller guy? So you have to have a, a plan of attack every time you line up against him to know how you're going to cover him, depending on the coverage that you're in. All right, I'll play Calvin Johnson real quick. You can play Delvin Bro, because I'm assuming <laughs> That's who, uh, now, Delvin, Delvin's a different type of guy. Delvin's more physical. He has that, that uh, arena football mentality, Canadian football mentality. So Delvin Bro is going to always play basically press man. And the one thing with Delvin Bro is he does what's called a backpedal out of his stance. So as you're coming off the ball, he's, coming, he's backing up to where now he can get his hands on you or at least try to cut you off. Uh, and that, in his situation, that's how he plays a lot of his guys, and he feels that nobody's going to run by him, so he's able to stay, a lot, uh, uh, stay with you a lot longer and have a great man coverage. Tonight's game may be more about pride than the playoffs, but there's another factor at play, guys. That's Determining right. the draft order. Determining the draft order. <laughs> don't, don't laugh just yet. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to ask I'm you laughing. about this. I know. I know you are. 
the four and nine Lions and the five and eight New Orleans Saints both have good chances of landing top 10 draft picks, maybe even top five picks, depending on how they finish. It could be the highest the Saints have picked since they chose Reggie Bush second overall in 2006. WDSU anchor Scott Walker catches up with draft expert Mike Dettelier about what the black and gold could do in April of 2016. All right, Mike, let's get right to this. The Saints are going to have a relatively high draft pick in the top 15 or so. So what position do you think they'll address? Well, the way I look at it, you're looking at 1A, 1B. you got to get a pass rusher. you got to get a guy that can put heat on the quarterback, either defensive end, outside linebacker, or a wide receiver that can change the field. So when I look at it, it's got to be pass rusher 1A, 1B, wide out that can put points on the scoreboard. There's a lot of questions swirling around the Saints franchise right now from its Drew Brees' career coming to a close to over the salary cap problems facing Mickey Loomis year after year, Flusher. That's right, but maybe the biggest question so far this season, the future of head coach Sean Payton. WDSU anchor Farrah Reyna talked to Pro Football Talk's Mike Florio about Payton's nine years in New Orleans and what lies ahead. Let's start with Sean Payton. Reports have been popping up all year about his potential departure after the season. Do you think Payton is coaching the Saints in 2016? Well, as Coach Payton said earlier this year, it's an annual event. Someone reports that this is his last year with the Saints, and eventually one of those reports is going to be accurate. He said he wants to stay in New Orleans. I think there's a lot of uncertainty lingering over whether he truly intends to stay, whether the Saints intend to keep him. and. His mentor, Bill Parcells, and this is a point Peter King likes to remind me of from time to time, Parcells' belief was it's better to leave one year too early than to stay one year too late. And that's one of the reasons why people look at Sean Payton's situation and wonder, is now the best time for him to go? And in hindsight, would last year have been the best time for him to go? Former Saints fullback, Hokey Gajon. Gajon was born in Baker, Louisiana, and played his college ball for LSU before being drafted by the Saints in the 10th round of the 1981 draft. He served in a variety of roles before heading to the broadcast booth and calling Saints games with Jim Henderson. He now faces the fight of his life. A gritty, gutty performer with a name straight out of central casting for Southeast Louisiana. Hokey Gajon is a man fans have known for years. From his days starring for LSU and then the Saints, Gajon is a hometown hero who truly gave his body to football. He's a guy that's had 26 surgeries in his life, so, you know, he can... He can battle through almost anything. After his career as a rough and tough fullback ended, Gajon became a scout for the Saints and then moved into the broadcasting booth, doing color commentary for the team's games. I mean, if you've ever spent any time around Hokey, you're going to have conversations that will make you uh, almost you know, die laughing just because of the, the comic relief that this guy provides. But also, you get some insight from a football player as to breaking down a play as a scout. What are, what are they looking for, et cetera. So he has a unique perspective that I don't think you can get anywhere else, coupled with those hokeyisms that, you know, he can go rabbit hunting with a tack hammer, et cetera. Those kind of things uh, make him really, really special. But Hokey is currently on a leave of absence from the radio station. Last month, he was diagnosed with an unspecified type of cancer. So while he receives treatment, former Saints star Deuce McAllister will fill in. But Deuce knows this gig is only temporary. Because as the T-shirts his colleagues wear say, Hokey is tough. This will, this will be a fight for, for Hokey, but one in which you know, he's suited to win and probably knock out. All right, Coach, quickly, your thoughts on Hokey. You know him well in his fight against cancer. Right. When I, when I think of Hokey, I think, first of all, of a great guy, good friend, tough tough, tough football player, and, and a tough battle against cancer. And he'll, he'll give it all he's got. You're watching the Dixie RV Saints on 6 Countdown to Kickoff coverage on WDSU. Oh, welcome back, everyone. He's one of New Orleans' most recognizable men, former Saints great Archie Manning. Earlier this week, I had a chance to sit down and go one-on-one -on -one with number eight. We talked about his alma mater, Ole Miss, coming to the Sugar Bowl. We talked about his oldest or his second oldest son, Peyton Manning and the future Hall of Fame career that he has had. And we, of course, talked about his former teammate, Saints great, Morton Anderson. 
if we could talk about the Ring of Honor. You went in two years ago with Ricky and Willie. Morton Anderson is going in. What does the Ring of Honor mean to you, and, and how special is it that Morton is joining you three? Well, Morton, Morton's a special guy. Uh, again, so many things make me feel old, but I can remember when Morton was a rookie, and um, uh, you know, I was number eight, he was seven, so we, his locker was right, right by mine, this young guy from, uh, you know, from Michigan State coming, coming in here, and uh, it was so obvious right away, uh, right away what a great, uh, what a strong leg he had, and we didn't know that he'd be the great kicker he was, but he's a good guy, he's been a good friend. This was a tremendous honor. You know, this Ring of Honor was, was kind of introduced two years ago, it was kind of new, so I was, I was extremely honored uh, to go in that first class, so to speak, with Willie and Ricky, two NFL Hall of Famers. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of the Saints. Um, I know Sean Payton had a lot to do with this, and now Morton certainly deserves to be there. Um, you know, if you if look in our stadium now, there's just going to be four people up there for we're getting close to what 50 years. So to be one of those four, and there's a lot more is going to fall. There's a lot on that team right now that'll be in here, obviously, one day. But um, you look around the league, there's a lot of places that maybe you know have 40 or 50 people. That's that's a lot. So I think to be up there with a minimum number of people, and especially be alongside. Morton Anderson, Willie Rove, and Ricky Jackson. A tremendous honor for me. Morton came so close last year to getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Do you think he gets in this year, and do you think he should be in this year? Well, I think he should be in. He was, um, I think when you talk about a kicker, you've got to remember, you know, the field goals and winning games and consistency. But before, um, before they changed it, I understand why they did the kickoff thing. It made it clear. So, so many kicks now go deep in the end zone, out of the end zone. But Morton used to put them out of the end zone before they changed it. And he, he was probably the best kickoff guy in the league. So that's, that has a lot to do with being a great, great kicker. And uh, people should, uh, the voters should recognize that. So it's hard for a kicker to go, I don't think there's, who, who's in? Jan Stenerud? Yeah, I mean, my goodness. Uh, so, um, he, he was a great kicker, and he was a uh, great teammate to, to a lot of people, and uh, so uh, it's going to be exciting Sunday. I'm really honored Sunday night. Unfortunately, Ricky, uh, Willie, not going to be there, so they've asked me to present Morton with his ring. I'm, I'm truly honored. Saints this year a little bit disappointing, last year a little bit disappointing. How closely do you follow the team? Does it still resonate with you in some way when the Saints do well? You enjoy it when the Saints don't perform well? You're still close to it in a way. You no, know, I got still got uh, great friends in that organization and on the coaching staff, and and um, I'm so much older than all those players, but know them. Drew's a good friend, and I, I follow them. And um, hey, it's a fine line there in football. You know, I'm kind of like everyone else. I thought over the summer, I said this this defense comes together. You know, really gonna have a good good football team. My offense is not any problem. I think there's a lot of injuries there, and it's just, it's hard. It's really, it's really hard. But um, I, what I know about this team, I don't think it's that far away. Uh, I, think, uh, I think they can finish, I think they can finish, a great game last week. I think they can finish the season strong, and um, it's, it's not that far away. I believe that. There have been some great athletes that have said goodbye to some illustrious careers. You know, Derek Jeter, Kobe Bryant, you know, do you talk at all with Peyton? Do you think about what his future may be, given the fact that statistically, and I know you all are so modest, but he statistically is going to be the greatest quarterback in the history of the NFL. Is that something that you think about his next step, or do you all discuss in any way? I was just with him, you know, and that's the way Peyton is. He's not going to think about retirement right now. He's, he's trying to get well. He wants to get well. He's got a, a team there that's in a playoff run. He wants to help if he gets back on the field. He wants to um, be ready. So he'll, Peyton's got plenty of sense. So when the, everything's done at the end of the year, you know, he'll sit down and um, um, make a decision. Whatever he does, uh, Peyton will attack it. If he steps down, he'll find something else and he'll go after it. If he wants to play some more, he'll go after it. So it'll, I keep saying it'll all work out. How excited are you that your, your alma mater is here for the first time since you were a junior in Oxford leading them to New Orleans? It's been so long ago, Fletcher, when I played in the Sugar Bowl. 
46 years, but that was uh, January 1 of 1970, and then one year later in January, I got drafted by the Saints. So uh, Olivia and I have lived here, raised our family here for the last 45 years. And certainly at that point, you know, when I was growing up, uh, Ole Miss came to Sugar Bowl quite often. Coach Vaught, um, I was on his last uh, Sugar Bowl team. He brought eight teams here, and he loved the Sugar Bowl. So he's looking down on this. He's, he's really excited. <laughs> Uh, but everybody at Ole Miss is, um, but I know through the years, as years went by, Olivia and I have kind of said, gosh, I just hope in our lifetime Ole Miss comes back to the Sugar Bowl. So we're real excited. Uh, everybody in Mississippi is excited. I can, I can tell you, and all the Ole Miss fans, they, they're going to be pouring into town, as well as Oklahoma State, who travels very well also. All right, stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back with our predictions.